security situation at the moment, uh, well, yes, uh, we're keeping the tabs as well on some of the states to watch. Uh, we do get some information about uh, a quiet bomb. We'll also get there subsequently to get updates on that. Uh, rivers, some, you just heard some of the guests allude to what may have transpired. They will also get there and see what the latest information is. We've heard from our correspondents in Quara. We've also uh, kept an eye on Emo, uh, but we're also watching to see what happens in some of the other states to watch. Well, at the moment, uh, we've got uh, GT Ogunye, a legal practitioner and uh, Channel TV's election consultant here with us in the studios. Thank you for coming on this uh, it's day, GT. It's my pleasure, always for coming. And then in Abuja, we've got uh, Major General, uh, retired Major General Gaba Wahab, who is a former Chief of Army Administration and former Director of Operations, GOC-1 Army Headquarters. He joins us from Abuja. And right beside him, we've got Bish Johnson, who's a former uh, U.S. Army Captain. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on The Verdict. Well, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Ugnuye. Concerning uh, some of the narrative INEC has put out there, uh, in terms of them trying to discourage bad behavior, because security will have a lot of headache, depending on how agents uh, all conduct themselves. When, uh, I did ask the previous guests as well, but we need your legal input on this. If INEC says, well, we won't issue certificates of return to any candidate who uh, perhaps if the returning officer declares you under duress, they don't want to reward bad behavior. What is the position of the law on that? Well, I'll answer that question directly, but let me just quickly say this. Uh, because in your intro, you did refer to it. Um, the most enduring and result-oriented uh, way uh, to discourage bad electoral practice on the part of the electorate and those who want to interfere the process with the process is a faithful and persistent enforcement of the law. Not homilies. I, I think that Heineck should all be pitied. You know, Heineck will issue statements, blandishments, uh, to discourage people. You could engage in voters' education, but all this will not do. And we keep making the point, all the societies that have succeeded in reducing criminality, in ensuring, you know, uh, that there is law and order, in ensuring that there is peace, have been societies that have rigidly enforced the rule of law, uh, enforced the law. The laws are there. In the INEC, uh, you know, protocols, and I'm talking about the Electoral Act and all its regulations, you have all sorts of offenses that are created. But if these are not enforced, what's going to be the dissuasion? So I, I call for that kind of thing. And that is not the task of INEC alone, although INEC has a role to play in it. Every year uh, or every election cycle, you see that electoral offenders are arrested, and the police would then report that, ah, we've arrested 300, we've arrested 1,000, and nothing is heard about it. Although the Electoral Act says that it is the INEC that has responsibility to prosecute <laughs> through its uh, officials, which is indeed uh, going to pose a challenge because the police will arrest, yeah. INEC will prosecute. Uh, apart from the work that INEC has to do with conducting an election, defending several election petitions in civil litigations, INEC is also expected by the law to prosecute. I think that something will have to be done to tweak with that to ensure that the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation and its lawyers and the police are able to prosecute rather than INEC being saddled with the prosecution unrealistically in my view. And for the person who has been declared as the winner of an election under duress, under duress <laughs> it's not just sufficient for INEC to say that uh, we're going to deny the issuance of a certificate of return to such a person, mm -hmm. thereby placing a body on uh, co-contestants to, to, to then go to court and then seek to nullify uh, any such certificate of return, uh, you know, and declare themselves, for example, elected, or that there should be a rerun election. I think INEC should go a step further than that. 
because they are such notables, and I don't want to mention their names, so one, two, three persons. One is an ex-governor who is going to lose his immunity, immunity soon. The other two is also an ex-governor who is undergoing uh, one trial, you know, uh, EFCC prosecuting. Get the two of them arrested and then prosecute them. And they can even start with them. But is there a provision for if the returning officer declares the result? People say that, look, the next thing is, well, if you say you're not going to issue the certificate of return, what's the next stage? Because that's not, there's no provision of the law in terms of when you withhold that certificate of return. What if the burden, who, those who they place a burden refuse to go to court? Uh, you know, the point is that, you, that's why I'm just advocating that INEC should go a step further. Because if INEC says that it's not going to issue a certificate of return, mm -hmm. the person who is claiming illicitly, that certificate of return, surely will go to an to election to tribunal it. to compel INEC to hand over to him. the certificate of return to him. The other person would demand and say that the certificate of return shouldn't be, returned, uh, shouldn't be given to the person. And INEC will stay in the middle and then, you know, wring his fingers <laughs> and say, well, let the court decide. So we are an arbiter. Whatever the court decides, we will comply. Even if the courts were to decide that a certificate of return be given to that person, who has won under the rest, you know, INEC would then comply. That is not good enough. INEC has a responsibility in the circumstances. You cannot just stop half of the way with all the result, mm -hmm. with the, or with all the certificate of return, without then going further to enforce the law. That is an infraction of the Electoral Act. And INEC can make examples of those persons particularly because they are highly placed. You know, part of the reason why the rule of law succeeds and law enforcement succeeds generally is that sometimes it's necessary to make examples of the untouchables, make examples of those who think they are larger than life, make examples of the rich and politically powerful. When you do that, all the lowly placed people, and I'm not saying this, you know, dismissively of the ordinary people, you know, will take heed. They will see those examples and then re-examine their conduct and try to become better, better persons in the society. So, but when you leave them and then you declare to the world, they committed crimes, you know, but we can't do anything. But the you, are, you are reinforcing the narrative that the law is supine and the law is helpless. The law is not that helpless because in the codes, in our provisions, the criminal law generally, when you're intimidating somebody, when you are threatening somebody, when you are acting more or less like a kidnapper, it, the law is there to take care of you. So it is not right for our institutions to, indeed, if I were to be the Attorney General, the following day I would address the press conference and say that police, go and arrest them. Won't you be accused as Attorney General? From on, the, you know, who got into government through a political party? Won't you be a accused of being? Partisan? That's the dilemma we face. The attorney general, who ordinarily should act as the attorney general of federation, also act as a politician in the minister of justice, as a minister of justice. So he wears two cap. So he looks at his political party and his interest, and then he turns a blind eye so we separate the to camps? a patent criminality. By law reform, is being suggested that the cap be separated. And that we should have an attorney general that will act regardless of the interests of parties and persons. Mm. Who will act more for the nation, for the country, than then pander to the whims and caprices of the political party that has produced him. I, I think that until yeah. that day, we, we may continue to have something what, a, a, as odd as this. What role do you see for the army in these elections? Let me say this. Currently, the military in Nigeria is conducting internal security operations in more than 32 states. Practically, it's as if Nigeria is in a state of undeclared war. Because soldiers are warriors, you know. The Constitution provides in Section 217, uh, paragraph 1, subparagraph so C, that when appropriately deployed by the president, subject to an act that is made by the National Assembly, the military can be deployed in internal security operations. And so the military has been conducting all these operations all over the place. 
Operation Scorpion, Operation Python, Operation whatever, all over the country. And so, since election is part of our lives, it becomes so unrealistic, therefore, even for the purpose of argument, to then say, oh, there are subsisting court decisions. One, Court of Appeal. Two, Federal High Court that stated that soldiers should not be deployed for elections. <laughs> the soldiers will say, ah, you deploy us to go and kidnap people, uh, to go and uh, ensure that there is no kidnapping. You deploy us to go and uh, bust bunkers. You deploy us, you even deploy the Air Force in Lagos here to go and bomb some people in Arikpo before we could have some peace and quiet there in an urban center because the police couldn't handle Evidently, that kind of challenge. So now election is coming, you say, we won't deploy us. Okay, you know, uh, just stay there and see what's going to happen. And when something worse then happens, people then say, why can't the soldiers be deployed? I am saying, therefore, that insofar as we continue to have these security challenges, it will serve no purpose How do we to come on an international television and be saying, you just be behaving like an ostrich. My basic submission is that we should address the problem of insecurity in our country. Each time politicians now are boasting about the success they recorded in the Northeast, about how Boko Haram has been, uh, you know, degraded, about how it's been technically defeated and so on and so forth. I, 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 I nod and say, okay, yes, you've done that. But you know what? Insecurity has festered in some parts in this country, in the entire forest of the Southwest. And I'm saying this emphatically here. The kidnappers who are foreigners, who are non Nigerians, who are there now as I speak, are so many. Relatives, a relative of mine, had been so kidnapped. He was traveling to Akura in Ondo State, between Ore and Ondo, in a place called Omifon. They were kidnapped in the commercial bus. And for about 40 minutes on that road, they were there, they were shooting, and they were then examining them as if we were in the era of slave trade. They would look at somebody who is well-fed, you know, obviously, you know, physically, look at the rich church and say, this one will pay some money. And then they eliminated some persons, not by killing them, and say, these ones are useless. And the ones that they felt could fetch good money, they took them into the forest. Three days, they were feeding on raw cassava. These ones weren't Nigerians. And the police that were calling to intervene were advising the families. You know what? The foliage is so thick. We don't have shoppers. We don't have anything. Pay them if you love yourself. And so what are we not seeing? You know, all over this country. So we've seen this. So when we then operate in that kind of environment, when an election is taking place in that kind of environment, it can't be imagined that, we, that there will be violence. So my basic submission is this, because I'm not an idiot. Unless you address those security challenges, you continue to have a challenged yeah. election, and violence right. will continue to attend our election. So, the military, therefore, in the circumstances, from what I have said, and you see it, yeah. obviously, we have a role to play regardless of what our courts are saying. And those who are complaining now about the military, yeah. in 2015, were the ones saying, including the civil society, we can be mentioning them, all of them in the situation room who are complaining now were the ones who said, if you don't deploy the military in 2015, there shouldn't be an election. But now, the yeah, right, situation has changed. <laughs> Partisan interest has changed. Allegiances have changed. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, statements on whether we should use the military or not have changed. <laughs>